Welcome back. This is part 8 of the study on the council in heaven. Last time, we took a look at Psalm 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. This psalm shows God amongst his council and judging them. They are unjust, and he is displeased with them. He tells them, I have said, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. They have earned death, like mankind, and condemned, like a certain prince who fell. The psalm then ends, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Are not all nations already his? Did he not create all? After God drove Adam and Eve from the garden, their prosperity grew in size and wickedness. So God destroyed them with the flood. After people had once again grown in number, they wickedly started to build a tower. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men, Beni a Adam, built. Note here that mankind is called sons of Adam. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will restrain them from which they have imagined to do. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. At this moment the Lord God says, Let us go down. But who are they that they go down with the Lord to confuse man's language, and scatter them abroad? How did they confuse their language? Was there a council member that was chosen for each language? Or did God just snap his finger like Thanos and it happened? In Deuteronomy 32, Moses tells us, When the Most High divided the inheritance of the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, note that Beni Adon again is used, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now, the term children of Israel seems strange, as Israel has not yet been born. But, only the Masoretic text reads that way. The King James Version, which follows the Masoretic text, therefore reads children of Israel. Texts such as the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which came from before the time of Christ, read Beni Elohim, the sons of God. Beni is plural for sons, but it is used at times when translated as mighty ones or heavenly beings, such as in Psalm 29, 1, which says, Ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, Beni Elim, given unto the Lord glory and strength, literally sons of God, yet not a single Bible translation out there says that. Previously, we examined the word Elohim. The word plural in nature implies majesty and spiritual nature, but... By itself, we may want to combine Beni Adon with Beni Elohim, which says the sons of God, and say the sons of God must be the righteous sons of Adam. But there is no indication that they are the same group. I personally feel that there is no reason to combine those two and that they are two separate groups. Let's take a closer look. God says, let us go down. So they go down and confuse the languages of man and... The Lord scattered them abroad from hence upon the face of all the earth. He divided their inheritance to the nations and separated them according to the number of the sons of God. When God said, let us go down, a number of them went down with him, and the nations were divided according to that number. In Genesis 10, it divides the Jephites, Hamites, and Semites into nations with the explanations such as, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after their tongue, after their families, in their nations. Each family line divided, after their tongues, after their nations. They were divided into 70 nations. Deuteronomy 32 tells us that the inheritance of the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his place of his inheritance. Jacob is the Lord God's allotted inheritance. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. God alone governed over Jacob's people. But the 70 other nations follow foreign gods. But that does not mean that we do not know anything about them. 
They are the sons of God that came down with the Lord to divide the nations. There is a theme that fills the scriptures of God calling his people away from the other gods. But one tribe will remain for the sake of my servant, David, for the sake of Jerusalem, the city I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me, and worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of Sidon, Chemish, the god of the Moabites, Malcolm, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. Each nation has this God, but Israel has the one true God. In Psalm 82, God is asking his counsel, How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Then tells them how they should judge. God sets apart these sons of the Most High to govern over people, but they are not doing as God has asked them. That is why the psalmist ends with the promise that God will inherit the nations. God has disinherited these nations. The scriptures tell us that God divided the nations. And least thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord God hath divided unto all the nations under the whole earth. So you can see here how God has given all these other nations to the other hosts of heaven to rule over them. But the Lord God hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron first, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Israel was taken to be the Lord's portion, but they keep running after those other gods. For they went to serve other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. We are even told that these other nations are given to these other gods. We can see from servants of these other gods that convert to the one true God a respect to their appointment. Consider Naaman, who was healed from leprosy. After being killed, he returned to the prophet Elisha. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth for thy servant? will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he, Elisha, said unto him, Go in peace. So Naaman takes earth from the territory of the one true God, so that when he prays in the temple of Ramon, he is on the soil governed by the Lord Jehovah. We see that the gods of these other nations are real beings with real rule and power. When Egypt faced plagues from God, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to replicate some of them. And after Ramses let God's people go, God judged Egypt's gods as well. For the Egyptians buried all of their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. Now, there are many examples in the Old Testament of the hosts of heaven and the gods of all the nations. If you thought of one I did not share, feel free to share it in the comment section below. God is in charge of all and gives charge to whomever he wants, whether holy ones from the hosts or mankind. In Daniel 4, God reminds Nebuchadnezzar, by vision, This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. God takes Israel, but they are continually unfaithful, running after other gods, given to the other nations. God uses other nations to chasten them, but also gives them a promise of a Messiah. Next time, we will take a look at how God takes the nations back through his promised Messiah. If you have any questions, please email me at brother3tyler at gmail.com or check out the website at bmschallenge.org. Until next time.